Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Ask an Expert. We're back after a little bit of a summer holiday, and we're back with lots of people watching. We have people from London. I see people from Pantanguish and Cottaging. We have India here, Philippines, Northampton, Qatar, Taiwan, more India, Uganda. We have people from everywhere over here. So thanks so much for joining us. It's my absolute pleasure today to welcome back Liz McCune. Liz, how are you today? I'm great, Ryan. How are you doing? Fantastic. Well, I'll take it from here then. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining and please don't hesitate to ask questions during the live show. Um, welcome to an Ask an Expert session hosted by the IKEA Foundation. For those of you who don't know very much about us, the vision of IKEA Foundation is to create a better everyday life for the many people, beginning with children. And as a philanthropy, we do this by making grants to partners who are building the conditions needed for families and the planet to survive. Now, Climate Action is one of five portfolios in the foundation, and our objective is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the timetable laid out by the historic Paris Climate Agreement. We fund partners who are raising the bar on corporate leadership across sectors of the economy, helping financial institutions to factor climate risk into decisions, and bringing the concerns of everyday people to the table so that our transition to low-carbon systems can be just and equitable. And that is a perfect segue to the theme of our Ask an Expert session today, the air that we breathe. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Jane Burston, who runs the Clean Air Fund, which is a global regranting institution funding projects to improve air quality. Jane previously worked as head of climate and energy science in the UK government, responsible for the UK greenhouse gas inventory and a 45 million pound science program. She managed a team of 150 scientists working in air quality, greenhouse gas measurement and renewable energy. And if that wasn't impressive enough, Jane Burston was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. She is one of the European young leaders or friends of 40 under 40, excuse me, 40 under 40 European young leaders by Friends of Europe, and she was previously the UK Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Jane, welcome. Thanks very much, Liz. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, great to see you. So let's kick it off by telling us what is the Clean Air Fund? What do you do and where do you do it? Um, well, as, as you just said, we are a global philanthropic institution, a very new one. Um, we just set up in September of last year, launched at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York. And um, we're the product of a group of different foundations coming from quite different backgrounds, but that want to work together on clean air, um, both to help improve people's health globally and to simultaneously uh, decarbonize the economy as quickly as we can. That's great. How big, you know, everyone is always focused on the impacts of these kinds of ventures like a clean air fund. So how big a deal is air pollution for people's health? Uh, well, it's massive, actually. Um, people call air pollution the invisible killer. And I'm never quite sure whether that's because a lot of the time pollution itself can be invisible. You know, it, it, on a day that looks clear, actually, it might not be. Um, there, might, there might be huge amounts of pollutants in the air. But also, I think it's invisible. Um, sometimes from the point of view of the effect that it has on people's health. Um, I was surprised to find out that 15% of deaths globally every single year are caused by air pollution. Um, in terms of outdoor air pollution, which is what we specifically focus on, that's 7 million deaths every single year. And it's, you know, that's a huge, huge number. It also has a really big impact on people's quality of life and the illnesses that they suffer from um, as a consequence of air pollution. Uh, the main illnesses that it can cause are things like um, respiratory disease, um, asthma, lung cancer, but also things that you might not necessarily associate with pollution, um, like heart disease and strokes. And the science more recently has come to connect dementia and even mental health problems with high levels of pollution. That's a pretty wide ranging set of effects that everybody should be concerned about. Now, if we go from the person to the planet, what are the links between air pollution and climate change? Uh, well, there's, there's two big links in my mind. Um, the main one is obviously that the causes of climate change are very often the same as the causes of air pollution. 
um, burning fossil fuels, for example, contributes to more than two thirds of global um, air pollution. And what that means is that often the same systemic solutions can be introduced to fix both things. Um, renewable energy, for example, electric mobility, an increased amount of active travel like walking and cycling, that will, will reduce air pollution as well as greenhouse gases because um, it's tackling the, the burning of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. The second interesting link um, is really about kind of public, public perceptions of both things because I think unlike climate change, even though the solutions are the same, um, air pollution is possibly more easy for people to understand, and more immediate, and it affects everybody right now. About 90% of people globally are living with and breathing air that is harmful to their health. So there isn't a single person who's unaffected. And air pollution seems less politically divisive than climate change. So political parties of all stripes are prepared to do something about it. You know, that really is quite profound when you think about it, that nine out of 10 people are suffering from really poor air quality. Um, it's so pervasive. That also brings me back to children because air pollution is particularly harmful to children. So how can we make sure that they're protected from air pollution and how can kids themselves be involved in those solutions? Um, very good questions. Um, I mean, just to explain briefly, um, how and why pollution has a disproportionate effect on children's health. Um, children are often more exposed to pollution. Um, for one, they spend more time outside. Um, the concentrations of pollution are often also uh, higher the closer you get to the ground. And, you know, so little children, toddlers or babies in their push chairs are often very close to the exact sources of pollution, like the tailpipes of combustion engine vehicles, for example. Um, and because some pollution is quite heavy, it does, it does hang lower in the air. So they're more exposed because they spend time outside. They're more exposed because the concentrations are a lot lower where they're breathing. And also um, they breathe uh, more quickly. So um, a 10 to 12 year old child will be breathing twice as fast as an adult, a baby four times more quickly. So they're just taking on more pollution per kilo of body weight than an adult. And because they're growing, they're more vulnerable physiologically, their organs are still developing and pollution can significantly restrict the development of lungs and brains. So, you know, asking about how to protect them and focusing on children um, in the solutions that, we, um, that we're trying to introduce is, is going to be critical. I mean, the, the sorts of things that we've seen from NGOs around the world that have been very effective are um, first of all, making sure that children and their parents are equipped with data about where their exposure is the highest. Um, UNICEF did a very interesting project in London called the Toxic School Run, where they equipped children with um, portable monitors and they were able to see the pollution levels throughout their typical day. And the peaks were at when they walked to school, when they were at break time and when they walked home from school. Um, because often in the city centre, it's roadside pollution that children are most exposed to. So I guess number one thing is provide, provide the data, uh, monitor around schools, involve children in data collection and make it clear where they're most exposed. I think number two, um, I mean, do this with caution, but help to communicate the impacts, the health impacts to kids and their parents. I say do it with caution because... Um, you know, we don't want to put fear into everybody, but they do need to be able to understand uh, exactly the, the harmful effects that pollution might have so that they're motivated to uh, avoid those. And then I think the third thing that we can all do is um, advocate for and provide the infrastructure that helps kids move away from polluting sources. So, um, you know, I gave the example of this UNICEF report highlighting how they're expo exposed on the way to school. One poll that came out from, I think it was the Child Health Initiative um, uh, a little while ago, was looking at how many parents would uh, advocate for their kids to walk or cycle to school. 
and they found that two thirds of parents really want to walk or cycle their kids to school, uh, but don't feel that they can at the moment because the infrastructure isn't safe. So, you know, giving people the opportunity to make the choices that they would like to make um, and, and get places safely and cleanly, I think, is the third biggie. Yeah, those are really great ideas. And, and there's so much common sense, especially what you say about not um, putting fear into children. Um, I also wonder whether or not there are particular ways that children who are learning so much more, so much more quickly these days, should they be doing things to advise their parents? <laughs> yes, I think, I think that's it. They're some of the best teachers. Yeah, <laughs> they probably are. Um, yeah, friends of mine who have kids who, who, that have learned about climate change are finding that there's, uh, there's no better moral guide than your child when it comes to making decisions about where to go on holiday, for example, or what kind of energy to buy. Um, so yes, I mean, I think it's tempting, especially given the effects of COVID, um, to um, hop in the car to take journeys. You know, people are understandably worried about getting on public transport and the walking and cycling infrastructure isn't there everywhere. Um, so uh, yeah, kids should be advising their parents for lots of reasons to find healthier alternatives like biking, using transit safely and walking. And I, when I say healthier, healthier because it avoids pollution, healthier because you can move away from the sources of pollution, but also healthier for completely different reasons like avoiding obesity um, and you know, kind of getting out and about and getting some exercise. Yeah, that's great. Hey, before we move on to the next topic um, and my next question for you, I want to just remind everyone in the audience again, please do send in your questions. And we've got a couple, if you don't mind, if I um, ask them. One came from Pakistan, from Sanam Koso, and he asks, is the Clean Air Fund working all over the world? Not yet. <laughs> um, we've got, so we started up last year and we want to make sure that um, we don't kind of get ahead of ourselves in um, trying to do too much too soon. We have a global program, um, which do, you know, with, with our projects all over the world, but we're working very deeply in three geographies at the moment. Um, India, uh, India has a significant percentage of the most polluted cities in the world, um, mm. and uh, some, some government plans to address that, which we're very keen to support. Uh, East and Southeast Europe, because um, in Europe, when you look at a map of the sources and levels of pollution, there's a really stark difference between East and Southeast Europe and Western Europe. Um, and we'd like to, to level up in that regard. And uh, the UK, because at the moment, uh, what with Brexit, all environment legislation used to come from the European um, Commission and uh, we now have a blank sheet of paper on which to draft new environmental legislation. So there's both an opportunity for that legislation to be very ambitious, but also a risk um, that it could be less ambitious than the regulation that we had before. So it's a, a good time to be working in the UK. And each year we intend to add um, an additional geography to our portfolio as we learn about what works. That's great. You know, uh, let's, let's segue a little bit to some of the, the circumstances we're living in right now, like COVID-19 and the economic effect it's have, having on, on the world. How has COVID-19 affected your work on the issue of clean air? Um, yeah, but very interesting question because th these are, um, I guess for everybody, and there's no, no walk of life or sector that is left unaffected. Um, but there are some particular links between COVID and air pollution. Um, I guess the first one is the health link. Um, people who have suffered high from high levels of pollution in the past might now have respiratory problems that put them more at risk of uh, contracting COVID and suffering the severe symptoms when, when they have it. Um, and that will result in more hospitalizations and deaths um, and very tragically from the poorest and most vulnerable communities because they're the ones that have been historically most exposed to pollution. And in a lot of countries, they're also the people who have the least access to health systems. Um, so, so they're kind of the preconditions that air pollution will have seeded in people is, is I guess, the main link. Um, but interestingly, over lockdown, people have seen pollution reduce significantly 
um, you know, the, the halting in lots of different sectors of the economy um, has also cleared our skies. And, uh, you know, friends living in Delhi who've been able to see the Himalayas for the first time. I think it was, it was kids in many places who are seeing blue skies for the first time. And how that, um, what that means, what this, this kind of change that people have seen means, I think is yet to, to really, um, we're really yet to, to, to uncover it. I think people could be more hopeful because they can see that pollution can be reduced. It can be reduced incredibly quickly, almost overnight in some places. Um, but at the same time, we need to maintain those benefits of clean air without the social and economic um, difficulties that lockdown has caused. Um, and so, and that's, that's quite a conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the third potential link is, uh, you know, now governments and businesses' minds are, are turning to building back governments are providing uh, economic stimulus packages and um, there's the opportunity there well and, and the risk but the opportunity for governments to invest in clean air infrastructure to make sure that the populations that individuals and the health system is more resilient in the future because you know and by reducing pollution they'll do that by um, enabling people to become healthier and more resilient to the effects of COVID as well um, there's also the risk that uh, stimulus packages won't come with um, ties attached to be green, for example, and that pollution could increase potentially as a consequence. That's interesting because there's in fact a, one of our other questions comes from Alexandra Munns who asks um, how COVID has impacted green initiatives which were taken on, are being taken on post-COVID and is there anything that we've learned from COVID that could help us improve our efforts at decarbonization? Um, yeah, I mean, good question. The um, lots of initiatives have been impacted because, you know, like like all activities, people can't meet together. Uh, or, um, campaign organisers, for example, who have planned public mobilisation or big meetings, have had to find a different way of advocating um, for what they want to see. And I think, especially with public mobilisation. It's going to take a while to for, for there to be a new model for that to happen and get people out on the streets with placards is something that uh, historically has really spoken to politicians and just isn't safe to do at the moment in most places. Um, in terms of the the second part of that that question, what could we learn or what new initiatives might we might we want to start? I think. Um, an interesting movement that has originated with many mayors around the world is to reclaim street space um, for walking and cycling um, in recognition of the fact that people are more reluctant now to get on public transport. We're seeing in lots of places um, rapid acceleration of existing programs to put in place bike lanes, for example, um, and train people on how to cycle and hand out bikes to especially health system workers. So if we can, if, you know, if those changes become permanent, I think that that could be a, a really um, interesting legacy of this COVID period. Hmm. That's interesting too, because, you know, you've, you've outlined so far so many things that seem like real solutions, they're quite common sense. And we have another question from Philip Lake on that topic. He's wondering whether or not what you see are the greatest barriers to change? Is it a cost barrier? Is it a lack of responsibility for the shared problem? Is it about awareness of the hazard or available solutions? And because it seems like there are so many solutions out there, love to hear your thinking about um, what Philip is asking. What are those barriers? Um, well, I think Philip's listed <laughs> quite a few of them. Um, well done, Philip. I think, uh, yes, all of, all of those. I mean, taking them in order, I think, uh, First of all, in some places, there isn't even data about the level of air pollution. I mean, on certain days, you can see it in, in the air, so you know that it's there. But there, you know, in Africa, for example, only 10 of 52 countries have even a single monitor, uh, and that's at the country level. Um, most places don't have pollution monitors at the level of granularity that will pick up all of the sources. So I think the first barrier is... Um, in some places, just a lack of information about the level of pollution and about where it's coming from 
that gives policymakers the confidence to to start and to know that what they're doing will make a difference. I agree with you that lack of awareness is probably also an issue. Um, I've been working on this issue for quite a while and um, on a near weekly basis and I'm um, finding out additional facts about the health and the economic and the environmental impacts. Um, and I think costs, like you say, could be a, a barrier. I mean, one of the things that um, I think is underplayed is the economic benefit of tackling air pollution. It's easy to think of, of it, tackling it all in terms of cost, but um, there will be huge cost savings from the health sector of uh, all of the people who wouldn't be seeking um, uh, health support for their illnesses if it wasn't for air pollution. And um, as we've been finding out more recently, air pollution really affects people's productivity as well. And we might want to talk about that a little bit more later, but I think there's a lack of recognition of um, how much more productive we would all be if we weren't uh, regularly being poisoned by the air that we're breathing. This sort of leads into my next question before we actually change topics, but still staying on the, the COVID one. I think you're, you're kind of hinting at it a bit. In what way, when this pandemic and its effects are over, in what way do you think the world will be different, um, thinking about it from your own organization's viewpoint? Um, Okay, well, there's, there's something, I think there's, there's a couple of things that I could confidently predict will be different. And then a couple of things where I think the jury is still out. So um, I will confidently predict, for example, that there will be a much greater focus from individuals on their own health um, and a much greater focus from governments on the resilience of their health system. Um, you know, we've seen one of the biggest issues um, was the capacity of national health systems to absorb that the very high rates of COVID um, when, when the infection rates got high. So uh, being able to keep people out of hospital um, by fixing other health issues, I think, will be a high priority for governments. What do I think um, I could less conf confidently predict? I think it's the point about public opinion. Um, Yes, people have seen clean air. Yes, they've seen that it can happen fast. Yes, they have um, seen that governments can act quickly um, to enforce lockdowns and that people will cooperate and, and pull together as communities. Whether we'll emerge from it all more or less divided, I don't know. Uh, I think there's also been an entrenchment of um, opinion in some places. And I also don't really know globally whether people, as the pandemic continues, are going to emerge with more or less confidence in the ability of governments to tackle big global issues. Mm. Uh, I, I can tell you what I hope. <laughs> um, I hope that the fact that uh, health resilience is a, is a big issue for, for individuals and governments combined with the economic benefits and the climate change benefits that work on air pollution also brings about that we talked about before, that air quality will continue to increase in focus as it has been doing now and will be one of the major global issues that's being tackled over the next decade. Yeah, you know what you're saying between health systems and the unknowns about public opinion and its shift um, actually gives me a great segue to introduce another question from the audience. Bazaret Kazim asks uh, whether or not the Clean Air Fund advises governments. Um, no, we don't um, provide any direct advice. We're, we're by and large a funder of um, projects and groups that are focused on reducing outdoor air pollution. We aim to support um, ambitious policymakers and politicians when they're going about implementing change. And so, for example, uh, one of the projects that we support is a network of mayors, all of whom have committed that their city will meet World Health Organization guidelines for safe air. Um, they've all set different deadlines on doing that, depending on how big the challenge is in their particular country and their city. Um, but we, we help them to um, meet together, to learn from one another, 
um, and provide technical assistance to some of their projects. So that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's another question that comes in from Sunam Singh from India, asking whether or not clean air and tobacco control, are there linkages between those two in the work that you do with the Clean Air Fund? Yeah, absolutely great question. Um, there, there are in uh, terms of the approach. So um, many people are surprised to hear that air pollution has rapidly overtaken tobacco as a, as a leading cause of death um, and public health challenge. And I think the sorts of issues that um, the anti-tobacco movement has faced over the last few decades are um, absolutely ripe for us to learn from. Um, one of the big things that they have had to tackle is um, a well-armed opposition that has attempted to undermine the science um, of linking tobacco to cancer, for example. Um, and that isn't happening at the moment in air pollution, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Um, other areas where we can learn from that movement are around behaviour change and what sorts of policy and regulation really help to, to shift the dial. I think after decades of attempting um, lots of work on behaviour change, it appears to me, and I'm no, no expert about the tobacco movement, that the main things that have really shifted um, consumption of tobacco products have been things like the ban on uh, smoking in public and more kind of um, top-down policy measures. Yeah. You know, it's um, everything that you're doing uh, through the Clean Air Fund obviously requires funding. And um, I just want to pause for a moment just to say how proud we are to be a funder of this initiative and to explain a little bit about how we came at that uh, decision. You know, we believe so strongly in the importance of collaboration between government, between civil society, between actors in business and finance, because climate change is such a huge solution and air quality requires that same kind of collaboration. And it's so, it's probably easier to bring people into the question on something that they feel very personally and immediately care about than something that feels far off and esoteric. And so we, we decided that this was a really great thing for us to help improve both um, health of people and planet by by doing this. But I know that that trying to get a lot of attention and to get the funding that you need, the resources to do the work that you do, is not always an easy thing. It can be a full-time job, in fact. Um, what does the, the funding landscape look like right now for air quality? And is it something that funders you're seeing are also prioritizing? Um, yes. Yeah, so it, the funding landscape is um, encouraging in some ways and, and not in others. I think the things that are encouraging are that it's an issue that's so cross-cutting. Funders from lots of different backgrounds are interested in working on it. Um, obviously, health funders, also climate funders, for the reasons that we've talked about at length. Um, funders who are concerned about children's health in particular and children's development and also um, equity. I, I kind of mentioned in passing how um, it's the most vulnerable and often the poorest people who are exposed to the highest levels of air pollution. And that's wherever you are in the world. Um, obviously, low and middle income countries have higher levels of pollution, but also uh, even in the richest cities of the world, it's the poorest people who are the most likely to be living next to a busy road or underneath an industrial facility. Um, so there's a there's a, a real um, kind of coalition of new a new coalition of different funders developing. Um, on the also on the encouraging side, the the funding to air pollution is growing very significantly um, and has done over the past five years. Um, less encouraging is just the absolute numbers. It's a very small. We we've um, got a database of all of the air, outdoor air quality funding that we're aware of um, from philanthropic foundations and from official donors, which is mostly development agencies and development banks um, over the last five years. And we, we have published a report called The State of, of Funding for Global Air Quality. And it um, highlights that over the last five years, there's been less than $300 million in total from all of those different types of funders to the problem. So, you know, when you think about the scale of the challenge, 15% of 
deaths due to air pollution, um, 7% from outdoor air pollution, and only $300 million in the last five years contributed to, to that topic, I think is quite, um, more than quite small. Um, I think the other, other thing that uh, we see improving, but not quickly enough, is the involvement of health foundations. Um, the, the percentage of funding that comes from health foundations is still very small, less than 5% of the total. And um, given the salience of this issue and uh, in public health, you would expect that to grow significantly over the next few years. Yeah, I, it, it is something that I also hope we can all grow. And I wonder whether or not this particular moment, you know, if you think about what we're doing right now and how funders and others are responding in terms of COVID, on the one hand, it feels as though there are so many more challenges in front of them. And on the other hand, it feels as though these are quite linked. Um, and so I wonder if you see any possibilities um, to bring more funders in because of this particular moment that we're in. Um, I think that uh, they, I would hope that there are. I think it's another one where the jury is out. Um, obviously, for health funders at the moment, COVID is a, a huge issue. Um, there's lots of rapid response funds being set up uh, specifically for um, the pandemic. And so how quickly funders' minds turn to the more systemic issues that's reducing population resilience uh, to pandemics like these, and that also can tackle other health problems, um, remains to be seen. Yeah. What if we turn and talk a little bit about some um, some specific regions where maybe health systems are less strong? Uh, we had a question, for example, um, from uh, someone from Somalia originally, Suleiman Abdullahi, and um, Suleiman is asking um, where there is no strong national health system. How do you um, address this? So many people are impacted by both COVID and air quality. Um, what kind of advice would you give? Uh, that's a difficult one. I think um, one thing that we try to do is work with the communities that are most affected. Um, so rather than giving advice, finding out uh, what their concerns might be, but also what their suggested solutions are. Um, and we attempt to support them to advocate, to kind of develop those solutions with their community and to advocate for them. Um, there, there obviously isn't one size fits all, but I think um, broad brush terms, reducing people's exposure is going to be critical. And in order to do that, they'll need to understand um, what air pollution is, when it's likely to be high, um, and exactly where, where they're exposed so that they can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any, um, if we're also thinking about the way in which um, so many needs kind of converge and people want to try to also bring so many solutions to the table all at once, you have to make difficult choices about where you believe the most effective and impactful solutions um, can be implemented in real time. So we had another question, for example, from Rob Holgate, who asked whether or not you're working with reforestation as a clean air strategy. Can you give us a view on, on that question and then also how that fits within yeah, the larger a range of solutions that, that you believe and the Clean Air Fund believes can really help uh, bring about uh, improved air quality in the shortest amount of time? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a, a project. I wish I had the output in front of me because it would just give me the perfect answer to this question, but I can refer people to it. And um, there's an organization called Pure Earth um, that has mapped for the first time um, ever, as far as we're aware, the efficacy of different interventions for both human health and climate change. Because one of the things that um, we were surprised we couldn't find, maybe it exists out there, but we looked and we couldn't find it, was if you were trying to maximize both things, what, where would you start? Is it with road transport? Is it with the energy system? Is it with agriculture? What types of pollution and where and what types of intervention will have the biggest effect. Um, and so if you look up that Pure Earth report, there's um, one chart which I absolutely love, which is basically a matrix of what's great for health, what's great for climate, and uh, what comes in the top corner. 
Um, from memory, I think uh, the biggie, as probably wouldn't be a surprise to everybody, is um, coming off of coal-fired um, power generation and domestic coal burning as well. Um, I'm not sure if reforestation was included and if so, where it was in the mix. There's evidence that, um, and I know this isn't the same thing as reforestation, but planting trees in city centres can help in some ways um, to limit people's exposure, partly because it, you know, if, it's, if the trees are planted in between the sidewalk or pavement and the uh, road where the traffic is, it can act somewhat as a barrier. There is also evidence to the contrary that uh, the canopy of trees holds pollution down close to the ground where people are walking. So it's by no means straightforward. And um, uh, getting into a little bit more of the kind of atmospheric chemistry side of air pollution, there some pollution is produced through chemical reactions in the atmosphere, as well as directly from it you know, being emitted from tailpipes. Uh, or other means of burning things. And so trees can provide beneficial effects to reduce those chemical reactions happening. So in general, it's um, in terms of reforestation, it's not something people tend to look at first and foremost with air pollution. I think partly as well because the forests often tend to be um, away from where people live. And if we're looking at the people's exposure as well as the general kind of global ambient levels of air pollution, um, they don't have a huge, huge amount of effect on that, but they're, they're the different considerations that you would look at with tree planting. You know, that's just such a, a, an amazing explanation. I feel like I just learned so much. And unfortunately, <laughs> the problem with learning is that it also makes it so much more difficult to choose because that very um, problem you were describing about tree cover holding pollution down, it sort of defies your expectations of what mm -hmm. you would help by planting trees in a city center. And that reminds me that um, one of our other colleagues, Joachim, is asking the question, you know, we, we know so much about the consequences of air pollution and there are solutions that are known and then the ones that are a bit more complicated. But if we went back to messaging alone to get people interested in the issue and working on the solutions um, and attached to them, what are the messages that resonate better um, at this point in time? Um, would, and just to, just to make another point on the um, on the tree issue because I I know it can be quite complicated. There, there's a I wouldn't want to say trees are ever say trees are a bad thing. Trees are an amazing thing, and I love trees. Um, <laughs> and and some, another consideration I guess is are there places that you can make uh, more appealing and attractive to work uh, to walk. Uh, say, for example, uh, green spaces to spend time, green spaces in cities. And if, uh, if you can reduce people's exposure by moving them more towards green spaces and away from traffic, that is another amazing thing that trees do. Um, so your question um, about messaging. I, one thing, one major lesson that um, I've certainly learned over the last year and a year or so of um, being in this role is that the more specific and local the messaging can be the more people the more it resonates because the more people see themselves in the shoes of of those um you know being affected um so to give an example uh people aren't that motivated by hearing about the global deaths numbers that i mentioned at the beginning of um of this conversation when they hear so many people die a year from air pollution it's such a big number, either they don't believe it, even though it's from the World Health Organization, or they believe it, but they think it's not people like me. This is people in a different country or a different type of person or a different age, or they understand that it's a reduction in life expectancy. And you know, they're, that's so far, the end of life is so far off for them. It just doesn't get absorbed. On the contrary, the sorts of th messages that people do retain and, and are motivated to act on are hearing about the health impacts of people who they can associate directly with them. So, for example, there was a study done by um, King's College in the UK looking at if you live in London or if you live in Birmingham, how much more likely are you to get lung cancer as a result of air pollution? how much more likely are your children to have their lung growth stunted? And they could put, there's, there's so much evidence out there about the health impacts. 
they could put direct percentages on, and I can't remember any off the top of my head, but you know, if you live in Bristol, for example, and I'm making this up, your child is 8% 8, 8 more likely to have stunted lung growth than if you live in the countryside nearby. Um, those sorts of things you can't deny are relevant to you and your family. So I think they're the messages that really sink in. The other thing that we know um, from kind of general communications uh, advice is that whenever you're communicating with people about a problem, it's always a good idea to communicate with them something they can do about it so that they feel agency in the issue and that knowledge doesn't lead to fear, it leads to power instead. So if people are communicating about this, I would always say, let people know something that they can do, especially if that thing is advocating for their rights, voting for somebody who's gonna do something about this because we by no means want to give people the impression that they're in this on their own and that only individual behavior change will help. Um, individual behavior change is very important but so is voting for governments that will put policies in place to address this for everyone. Thanks, Jane. That's a wonderful answer. And I take away two things from what you've just said. One is empower people, tell them what action they can take when you communicate. And the other is really about that idea of how you personalize it and localize it, because the general statistics might not work for every audience, but when they understand how it affects someone they love or someone in their region, someone within their windscreen, their, their periphery, it matters a lot more. Um, but I do think some of the general messages are also quite important. Uh, one of the studies that I was reading lately that you guys put out about worker productivity really resonated with me. If we're trying to recover from this awful COVID and the economic recessions that are following, um, and you know that productivity is connected to that, then healthy air, clean air, quality air makes such a difference in terms of economic productivity and recovery. And I, I will even quote you, I think one of your recent tweets said that we know clean air makes us healthier. Economics research shows it can make us wealthier too. And that's a really great one. Um, so we all need hope in this time as well too. And let me, let me now turn to maybe one of my final questions. Um, because you are analyzing the scale of air quality projects globally every single year, what changes, um, what is changing? What are you seeing changing? And what would you like to change going into the future? Um, uh, so one thing that we're seeing change is that many more projects are coming on stream um, to measure the level of air quality using low cost sensors. I think this is fantastic to see because there's been a leap forward in the technology that enables us to, to monitor air pollution. Um, there's still quite a few things that need to be ironed out with it. It's by no means a panacea. These, these monitors um, aren't perfect by any means and um, need to be used with care, but they have the potential to really reduce the cost of monitoring and make it much more accessible for countries all over the world rather than just the richest. Um, what else have we seen? We've also seen the um, uh, countries that um, accept or receive air quality funding has changed a little bit. Um, historically, there was more funding going to uh, the US and China than there is now, for example. Um, and there's an increase in the amount of funding going to um, other countries like India and some parts of Europe. Um, and did you did you also ask what do I hope will change? Yes, um, please. I hope um, that I mean. So let me give you three big hopes because uh, I think where I can see we're coming to the end of our time and and end on um, a kind of promise and call to action. I think my hopes are one that businesses will get much more involved in this issue. Um, the private sector is largely absent. Um, there are a handful of companies doing quite a lot, but very few that have an air quality strategy in the same way that they have a climate strategy, for example. Very few talking about it with their employees or their customers. So one hope uh, is that in a big way, the private sector will start to come on board. Um, second hope is that we do recognize the multiple wins of tackling air pollution for health, for climate change, for equity, for education, which we haven't talked about, but is another big one, um, for human rights, actually, and the right to breathe clean air, that um, 
everybody and especially funders start to recognize the the kind of multi-pronged benefit of tackling air pollution and that funding to the issue increases significantly ten, tens of times fold as a consequence um, and thirdly um, I guess I hope for all of you on the call uh, that people take this away and think about how they could use their assets to work on the issue um, for each person it might be different it might be something that they could do in their workplace something that they want to do individually um, how they question their local member of parliament or mayor but um, if everybody on this call uh, did one salient thing on the topic, I think that uh, th there'll be a ripple effect and things will start to change much more quickly. Jane, you've given us so much to think about on this call, and I'm just going to reiterate your final three hopes for the future. Private sector, step in. You have the innovation. You have the resources. We need you at the table. Uh, the intersectionality of all of these issues that tie clean air to climate change, health and productivity. Let's get that recognized. Let's deal with that intersectionality and bring more funding and resources to address it. And finally, for individuals out there, use your personal capital, spend some of it, work on this issue, do what you can, contact um, people in charge, decision makers, tell them what you need, um, step up as well because you're part of the solution as well. So with that, I want to thank so much Jane Burston, Clean Air Fund, our partner. We're so proud to be funding you and working alongside of you. And it's just great to have you here for an Ask an Expert. And now I'm going to turn it back to Ryan to wind us down. Thank you so much. I want to thank you both. You've uh, given us a lot to think about and a really, really interesting conversation. I love the challenge that we're issuing to everyone who's watching today and everyone who's going to watch over the next few days the recording to really think about something that we can do. So I hope that everyone will do that. And if you do do something, or if you think about something that you can do, uh, add it in the comments and tell us what that is. We'd be really curious to see. And I know there were a few questions that we didn't quite get to. So we're gonna collect those questions and do our best to either respond to those uh, in the comments or through Twitter, but try and get some answers out to you. I hope uh, that's okay with you, Jane. We'll get you a few more questions, even though you've been inundated with so many today. Uh, and on that, I actually have to say thank you to our audience because this has been such an engaging session. The number of questions we've got and the quality of questions has been super inspiring for me. Uh, I hope for you guys too, because it really shows that people are so concerned with this topic as they should be because it impacts every single one of us. So with that, uh, I will say a final thank you to Liz and Jane. Uh, you can join us for our next Ask an Expert session. We have Rem Koolhaas here on 1 October at 3 p.m. CEST. We're excited for that. Uh, so we hope to see you again very soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.